Good evening. An explosion involving British Columbia negotiations in Ottawa last week, and today an explosion in Victoria involving a minister crossing the floor of the House, an ex-minister. But first, here's Ted with the rundown. Time in the slammer or an electronic bracelet in home? Which would you choose? Some intermittent offenders will get the choice now that BC has decided to try out the controversial electronic shackle. In the studio with Webster, BC's Attorney General Brian Smith. Is privatization of Crown corporations preferable to policies of restraint? Or how would you like the chance to buy something that, as a taxpayer, you already own? Tonight, Webster talks economics and the two sides of privatization with Dr. Madsen Peary, architect of Britain's privatization strategy. Attorney General Brian Smith was booked in today to talk to me about the activities of Big Brother with electronic devices to keep an eye on certain um, inmates of our institutions. But since then, Mr. Smith, two things have happened. First of all, let's go straight to the Kempf affair. Kempf was fired this morning from his position as Minister of Foreign, uh, from the Cabinet by Mr. Van der Zand. Why was he fired? There's a report done by the Comptroller General into the financial administration of his office uh, revealed some unacceptable financial practices in the opinion of the Comptroller General and the Premier accepted those recommendations and uh, decided not to take Mr. Kempf back into Cabinet. And decided he couldn't wait but had to act today, is that correct? That's right, and he made the report public today as well as he promised he would do. I have the report but I haven't had a chance to read it yet, so I must pick your brains a little bit on it and put it to you this way. Is this, as far as the, uh, the government is concerned, the end of the affair? He has crossed the floor. Mostly the end of the affair. The, there are some recommendations in there for some follow-up and for some modification of the rules. For instance, uh, we don't have to disclose uh, mineral claims and it's recommended that we should. It's recommended also that there be investigation on a disclosure issue in Mr. Kempf's uh, is there facts, any but it's not serious. There's, no, there's certainly no criminal follow-up. No RCMP follow-up on no, this? No, absolutely not. But it's, a, it's of great interest to the public to go through the areas from the press release and the areas in which he did not uh, uh, give proper accountability included constituency expenses. Yes. What did he do that was undesirable? Well, what he did was to uh, have a constituency uh, office which was a trailer and uh, that was a good practice, I think, because of the travel that he has to do throughout his whole riding. And he would, out of his constituency allowance, which I think is 28000 a year, he would pay about $700 a month for the finance charges of the trailer, which was fair enough. And then his wife kept the records and uh, the trailer was leased in her name. So she'd make those payments, but she also received uh, payments for 11 out of 12 months of about $650 from the constituency allowance, and the rest of the allowance wasn't accounted for. So there was, a, there was an implied criticism by the Comptroller General there in that practice. Was there anybody on the payroll of the Ministry of Health? Oh, that's, oh she, was, she also received salary from the Ministry of Health. Was that wrong? I don't think any of this is wrong. I just think that uh, taken all together, uh, your wife on one payroll, uh, constituency uh, payments made to her, no secretary apart from your wife, that uh, that's a practice that uh, the Comptroller General uh, Frowns upon. Uh, frowned upon. Yeah, I don't think that this is certainly not criminal. It's not, uh, it wasn't, I don't think, done to defraud anyone. I think it was just something that uh, was frowned on by the Comptroller General. He's criticized for outstanding travel advances. Does he have to pay money back? Yes, but uh, travel advances are, are quite uh, frequent, but in the, in the case of Mr. Kempf, he got travel advances when he was a parliamentary secretary in 1985. I think they uh, totaled some $5,600, and to this day those haven't been paid back, yeah, even though he became a minister in 1986 and received further travel advances as a minister. So all of those would have to be paid back. But again, those weren't denied. There wasn't any attempt to cover them up. Those are just things that should have been taken care of. One last question. I'll go through the report in detail before I interview Mr. Kempf tomorrow. The use of airline, airline bonus points, was mm -hmm. that uh, against specific guidelines of your government? 
Uh, it was against the, uh, the tr Treasury Board uh, directives that were sent to uh, the public servants and also were given to Cabinet and were explained to us in Cabinet that we were not to use bonus points that had been accumulated on airline tickets that the public had paid for. Uh, and he used the one to buy a ticket for his wife somewhere. Yeah, uh, in fairness to him, it was so she could go to a conference where he was representing the province, but that was not an approved procedure, unfortunately. And he may have to pay that money back. May have to. So how much does he have to pay back altogether? I haven't added it up, but I think it's about uh, 13000 in advances and then $1,000 for an airline ticket. Are you surprised he crossed the floor today to sit as an independent? I'm very saddened by the whole thing. I'm sorry for Jack Kemp. I think he's a very a very good fellow and a good member in the legislature. I'm sorry for him, I'm sorry it happened, and I am sorry that he's crossed the floor. Last week in Ottawa, our Premier, Mr. Van der Zam, took a real kicking from the Métis Indians, and in general, because you would not agree to the amendment to, to the Constitution to entrench the rights of native self-government. How could you refuse to agree to that? when it's already in the charter that existing, um, existing rights shall be given to Indians? Well, uh, some of the natives already argue that uh, they have the right of self-government, that it is, it is there irrespective of the Constitution, that it's there and it's inalienable and it doesn't need to be expressed. But what uh, we were asked to do in Ottawa last week at this conference, Jack, was to write for all time in the Constitution the provision for self-government for natives to require the provinces to negotiate self-government agreements with natives, not just natives living on reserves, but groups of natives <coughs> living off reserves, that is in cities, were to have these self-government models, whatever they might be. And uh, our Premier uh, believed, along with the Premier of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, that uh, we couldn't go the route of committing our people to uh, some sort of constitutionalization, some freezing of that for all time without knowing what it was. Did you regard this as a blank check for the bands in British Columbia to uh, set up little nation states within the province? Well, it, that, that's one uh, result that could flow from that. But when you go to a conference like this and when the level of aspiration is so high and unreal because of the process over the years and because of uh, the way that the natives have been led on by federal bureaucrats and officials and politicians for so many years, then you get great disappointment. But it must be remembered that at that conference, not, the natives did not wish the model that uh, the Prime Minister proposed. They turned it down because they said, we don't want to just have self-government which is agreed to between the three levels of government, each band to band. We want to have the right freestanding, untrammeled, unconditional, not negotiated, not spelled out, there freely for all of us. And we want that in the Constitution, regardless of whether it takes away from rights of provinces or whether it takes away from rights of the federal government. And they couldn't accept the proposal either. So but they wanted the inherent rights of self-government for their traditional lands in the Constitution. That's right. Now, can they now not, however, go straight to the courts on the same interpretation? That's what they will do. And of course, in this province, they are already in the, in the courts now on major land claims. How many different negotiations would you have been involved in if you had agreed to this? Over 300 different uh, negotiations in the province of British Columbia. You see, uh, what right does a province like Prince Edward Island have to preach to us on this? They have 650 natives, a f handful of bands, we have in this province uh, almost a thousand native people, if you conclude the non-status. We have over... How many thousand? A hundred thousand, mm -hmm. if you include the non-status. We have uh, also over 300 bands, and we have 1,650 reserves, and we have no major treaties west of the Rocky and Mountains. You're saying, therefore, that this broad, amorphous, self-government inherent right would have put you and the people of British Columbia are totally at the mercy of unlimited claims for states within the province. It could do that. And, or am uh, I exaggerating? No, I say it could do that. I mean, you just don't know the impact of it. But there are presently uh, about 17 
uh, act of land claims in British Columbia, and the amount of land claimed is 275,000 square miles, or 70 percent of the entire land surface is under a land claim with the Federal Land Claims Office. But that, of course, is totally unrealistic, and no court in the world would give anybody 270,000 square miles of British Columbia. Well, can I, can I read your evidence into the record before you leave the service of the media? Brian Smith, Attorney General of British Columbia. We'll get down to the electronic surveillance and other things after the break. I am wearing an electronic shackle. I am now technically under 24-hour-a-day, computerized electronic surveillance. In case, as a prisoner, I step out of line. Is that an accurate summary of what you're planning to do for certain inmates in British Columbia Correctional Institutions? You are, you are shackled with a transmitter. You would also have a receiver, and the two would have to mesh. In your case, we would take the transmitter and put it on your golf bag. Then we'd know where you were all the time with the it's receiver. It's not very funny, Mr. Attorney General. And furthermore, this would be up underneath my trouser leg and my ankle. Is that correct? <laughs> No, no, that's the, uh, that's the receiver that you have there. The transmitter, the receiver would be attached probably to a, a telephone or something. The transmitter uh, is a bracelet, which is a lot lighter. It's over there on the left of the desk, and you'd have that on your ankle or your wrist. This is what I'd have on my ankle or my wrist? Yes. This is what would be where? It would probably be at the telephone. At the telephone, mm -hmm. connected to my telephone? Yes. This I have on my ankle and my wrist? That's right. You uh, could wear it on my wrist if I wanted to? Sure. Oh, yeah. Except that everybody would know I was under electronic surveillance if they spotted it. But it would not. be better if you were in jail because everybody would know you were there, you see. Yeah, no, but that's, that's not to the point. Why are you doing this? Well, Big brother in spades, isn't it? No, Imagine no, no. having minor offenders no. No. being tracked around the country by electronic surveillance. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a, it's a very sensible thing. We have a lot of people now... I think about 200 of them in the Lower Mainland who are serving intermittent sentences for uh, under 90 days. These are people who go and spend the weekend in Ocala. Uh, we provide bed and breakfast for them on the weekend. During the week, they work. Now, I think this is crazy and a waste of public money. Much better to have these people out working and at home uh, seven days a week knowing where they are. Half of them are people involved in drinking driving offenses. Uh, why, why not have them monitored on a thing like this, and then we know they're not getting behind the All wheel right. of the car. I've got the device on my telephone. I have the thing on my ankle or my wrist. Uh, what orders do I have from the court? Uh, does it mean, therefore, that on Saturday, from Friday night, midnight, till mm, Sunday night, I must stay within the confines of my living place? Well, the orders would be different for different offenders. Uh, the pr orders would probably be <coughs> that Monday to Friday uh, you, uh, you, you'd be working and you'd have to be at your home, say, from 6 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock the next morning. And if you went uh, within 200-foot radius of the receiver, then that would be caught and you'd be in violation. But during the day, you'd work and do other things. Went beyond the 200-foot radius of the receiver. We'd pick it up. That's right. You'd pick it up. Have you got a 24-hour monitoring service for the number of people who might be wearing these? Sure, because it would be done on a computer at uh, the Vancouver Pre-Trial Center, uh, the operator of whom is already monitoring prisoners that are inside. And at a very small additional cost, he'd monitor you and the other 24 that are in our control room. And if I disappeared off the computer within the my... Uh, restricted time, would he then send a police car to catch me, pick well, he, me up? Well, some action would be taken. Uh, a call would be placed to find out what had happened. The police would go after you if your whereabouts weren't accounted for. Sure. So um, can I take a bath with my thing? I can't take this off when, when I'm wearing it properly or the other one because they've both got little studs there. And if I uh, cut this... Well, uh, we would stress cleanliness, and uh, there would be provision for you to take a bath, yeah. No, uh, they're waterproof, I happen to know. Yeah. The devices are waterproof. But uh, how many people do you plan? Oh, the judge would say to me, okay, Webster, you've been found guilty, we'll say, touch wood, of impaired driving, and therefore you're going to spend 30 days 
at weekends. Mm -hmm. That might be 15 weekends, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Or it might be a 30-day period allowed out Monday through Friday and at home at the weekends. Is that correct? That's correct. Might it also be home every night at 6 o'clock until 6 in the morning, no driving except to and from work? Correct. It could be all kinds of things, but the important, can you, can important, thing, important thing is that you would not be taking up space in a prison and uh, we would know what you were doing uh, the major portion of, of your leisure day, so there'd be no chance for you to go and violate your... So therefore it would be impaired drivers or drinking drivers of some kind. Who else, for instance? Petty thieves? Yeah, um, minor offenses, uh, property offenses, anything for which a person is sentenced to less than 90 days. Would you use this on juveniles too? We probably would, yeah, eventually. You haven't got the legislation to do that yet, have you? Well, we'd have to have some legislative changes, but we're not experimenting, first of all, with juveniles. We're experimenting with this uh, under 90 day sentence group, people who are not in there for violent crimes. What's it going to cost? Uh, about one seventh of what it costs to have them in jail. One seventh? Yeah, $10 a day instead of 70. Have you had much objection? Because what, they, what kind of makes the hair stand up in the back of my head? It's like putting a little device into somebody's brain to know precisely where they are at all times. Well, And you know how many paranoid people we've met who believe there is such a device available. Well, I don't think that there's going to be a great uh, complaint about that because, first of all, it's going to be voluntary. Oh, uh, I missed that point. It's going to be voluntary. Uh, if you would rather spend that time in jail, you can. We're not telling anyone they have to go in this system. But if you'd rather be out and rather be in your home, with a little bracelet uh, on your ankle, uh, then you can have that option. And yes, we're going to violate your civil liberties by putting a bracelet on your ankle, but we also violate your civil liberties when we lock you up. Uh, and, you, and you probably violated somebody else's civil liberties or you wouldn't have been locked up. So one of the basic reasons is humanity, is it? No. Humane way of treating people? No, it isn't at all. Um, it's, uh, it's a better way of managing people. It allows closer surveillance and it saves money. Would a person be able to use their own, in my telephone is, a, is some kind of device, and near my telephone is a device which lets you know if I've strayed beyond 200. Yeah. Can I use my telephone at other times? Oh, sure. All the time. Mm -hmm. How long are you going to do this experiment for? About nine months. Do you think it'll work? Sure, because uh, it's had good, good success now in 20 American states, and the best uh, experiment with it is right down here in Portland in Clackamas County, and it's worked very well. As a matter of fact, they used it to keep an eye on errant fathers who failed to make child support payments, did they not? I'm told in Oregon they used the device for that. Well, I don't, uh, that I don't know. That's something new. I didn't realize that. Why doesn't it, uh, why doesn't it uh, breach civil liberties? It does, you admit that, don't you? Well, sure, but so does prison. Uh, do you, you remember the famous note that George Caldor left on his napkin at William Head when a, when a, when a group of uh, visitors came and he served them lunch and the one that he thought was the most particularly silly he left a note on her on her mat and when she lifted up her soup bowl she looked at it and the note said help they're holding me here against my will. <laughs> Brian Smith, I don't know what the phone calls will be about, they might be about uh, Kemp, they might be about um, Indian land claims, or they might be about this big brotherish device after the break. Started off by telling her that Jack Kemp, former Social Credit Cabinet Minister, has now crossed the floor of the House, questioned the Attorney General on his hardline report about uh, native self-government. You would say hardline. Fair line. Are you still prepared to negotiate? Yes, indeed, and uh, we have our first success story in the Seashell Band uh, agreement that has been reached between the federal government, provincial government, and that band. That's where the Seashell government has taken its reserve lands and created, in fact, a municipality. Yes. Are you prepared to negotiate with the other bands on that basis? Absolutely, and on variations of that which may suit them better than uh, the arrangements for Seashell. Are you prepared to negotiate with those people like the Haidas who just want the lot? It's very difficult to negotiate on uh, that general a basis. I think you have to come down to some specific negotiations. You can't just negotiate on someone who 
wants, uh, want, wants full governance of part of Canada. Yeah. But negotiations, the door is not closed, providing they come to you with reasonable propositions. The door is wide open. The Premier has said that. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Webster. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask the uh, Attorney General there, uh, those devices that the, they wear for nonviolent offenders, uh, how long is one required to wear that for? For the, uh, the the part of the day, probably when you're at home, uh, if if you had an, a sentence, say you had 30 day imprisonment, which you could serve intermittently, then uh, and you had a job, then what would happen normally is you'd spend every weekend uh, in prison and you'd go home and work during the week. Well, under this arrangement, if you consented to this, uh, you'd spend your weekend at home, but you'd wear that bracelet while you were at home. Just a minute. Do you take it on and put it off yourself? Well, there, uh, there, are, there are rules on that. I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure how that works. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, and then once your sentence is over, then, you, uh, then it's removed, and uh, whoever's next gets the gets it then That's after it. that. That's it. Next guy gets a 10. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask the Attorney General why Jack Kemp has not been charged for this. And uh, from what I understand, he is to pay back the $13,000. It seems to me that it ties in with uh, Jack Davis's conviction. He was charged and convicted for a much smaller offense. Does this mean that if I steal $13,000... No, 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 nobody has been accused of, back. I don't of get charged. stealing $13,000. No, no I, I... He has to pay it back. Well, but I, I don't think this is anything uh, like stealing. There was, this was no uh, attempt to take anything and cover it up. This is somebody who took regular advances, as they were entitled to do, but uh, didn't return those advances and uh, should have attended to that earlier. But there was no denial that the advances were, were owed and no attempt to avoid them. They just The check hasn't arrived, that's all. The every nickel was known what every nickel was and yes. the standing travel advances, the temporary travel advances, but not properly accounted for and all the balances are turned as required under your regulations. Well, how did correct? Jack Davis get charged? Well, that was a different thing altogether and I'm not about to com compare the two issues. Am I right on that, Attorney General? Absolutely correct. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Um, I'd like to ask, is it 200 feet? that they have, they would get a signal that they ha were out of place regarding the bracelets, 200 feet? Up to that, it can be set up to that amount, I think. Sometimes it's 100, I mean, some, sometimes 150 feet. Well, do you know how far that is? Yeah. Not very far. No, that's right, but... I uh, mean, you, if you... <laughs> if you just think of it this way, ma'am, it's the maximum radius is 200 feet from the location of the receiving device close to the telephone. Ah, uh, well... So therefore, it's in an apartment or in a house, yes. and it's a hundred feet either way. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to leave your grounds. That was what it would amount to. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, you wouldn't be able to go very far. I mean, you wouldn't be able to be able to go most of your house. Well, the point is that they don't want them to go drive their cars at weekend or any other time. Oh, yes, I, I can understand yeah. that. Uh, not that I'm terribly keen on the whole idea, but two hundred feet. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead from Sam and Arm. Uh, yes, I was wondering, how is this going to act as a deterrent? I mean, if a guy wants to go out and steal, he's going to do it still. And isn't it better if he's in jail where and I can be watched on him all the time? Well, in these intermittent sentences, they, uh, they aren't being watched uh, a lot of the time. They're, uh, they're spending five days in the community and two days in jail on the weekend. So you don't, you don't know what they're doing the evenings of the five days that they're in the community. Do this you think that it'll work, though? Well, it's good track record in uh, a number of American states that have tried it. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that's uh, resulted from it that they found in the states, and that is that by confining people to their homes in the evenings for the period of this program, uh, people have changed their lifestyles uh, quite a bit and uh, have had a more stable family life, and following the period of incarceration, uh, a number of them have stayed with that kind of lifestyle. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so well, I was wondering if you could tell me what the penalties are for when you're charged with impaired, your first and second offenses, and with using these, re these transmitters. Well, the first offense is, uh, is normally a fine. And uh, that fine, as, as I recall, ranges from anywhere from three or four hundred dollars, maybe to a thousand dollars. That's the first time. And then the second time, uh, there's mandatory imprisonment and uh, you have to be imprisoned, I think, for a minimum of a period of two weeks. And then for the third and subsequent times, there's higher mandatory imprisonment. 
When you get two weeks mandatory on your second offense, if the Crown proceeds by indictment, do you do that in jail or can you do it intermittent? It's, it's, it's normally done intermittent. That's up to the judge. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Attorney General, I'm wondering if you and your ministry are considering implementing a comprehensive no-fault tort compensation scheme in BC similar to that which has been so successful in New Zealand. No, we're not. Um, ICBC uh, looked at that about three, about three years ago, if my memory serves me correct. In fact, we had a provincial task force that, that looked at that, and there was at that time some support for it. But uh, the government of the day, around 1982, um, thereabouts, 1982, 1983, considered this and decided not. Now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't in the future, but uh, it was laid to rest for the time being. There was no fault in insurance. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, good, good evening, gentlemen. I want to say that uh, I think Mr. Smith has a good idea there that what they're doing, and we're going to miss you, Jack. But I talked to you many years ago when you were on the radio. Uh, I gave you the idea, or came up with the idea. Why don't you use Ocean Falls as a as a place for to train young individuals to how to work in uh, paper mills and stuff? Well, there are lots of uh, of such places, you know, that it that would be good for that. Uh, you don't want to establish any kind of quote penal colony anywhere in the province, do you? No, we we have we have a number of young offenders units that we're planning around the interior, but they're not penal. When are you going to close Ocala? I forget now. Uh, the plan is we hope to completely close it by 1991. Go ahead, please. Hello, I'd like to ask the Attorney General why, when people write a letter to their office, the secretary answers it saying that he will answer it personally when he gets back and he never answers anybody's letters. Well, I guess that uh, any of us can, can have that difficulty. At least the, uh, the secretary acknowledges the letter initially, which is better than not acknowledging it. But if it isn't followed up, you should uh, phone the office and uh, remind the minister of that because that's something we try to avoid. And when it does occur, we say we're sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Ah, yes. I feel that this, uh, this tracking device isn't much of a deterrent at all. You know, if I can stay in the, con you know, in the comforts of my own home instead of staying in a, a miserable prison, uh, you know, I'd certainly take that. It doesn't seem to me like it's, you know, much of a deterrent, you know, much of a punishment to anyone. Well, I would say to you that uh, the people we're, we're reaching in, with this device are people that are already not... Uh, not spending very much time in prison. They're only spending uh, weekends or short periods of time. And we think we can watch their movements uh, more closely and control their behavior more closely this way than, uh, than by the system of having them ho on, on their own five days and in prison two days. Yeah, but I mean, if I, if I was charged or arrested with um, drunk driving, for instance, it would be an embarrassment to me to say to my friends, I, I'm not around on weekends, I have to be in prison, mm -hmm. I, you know, as, as opposed to saying, no, I'm just sticking around home. You could bluff your way through it as long as you wanted. A very important point. Yeah. Psychologically, going to jail at the weekend was a humiliation and a considerable deterrent among the kind of non-criminal, if I can mm. say that, type drinking drivers. Well, I think that, uh, you know, she has put her finger on one of the uh, serious problems with this kind of program, and that's why in uh, introducing the idea, we're introducing it as a pilot with 25 people, and uh, her comment is the very sort of thing that'll be uppermost in our mind. I mean, are we, are we lowering the, uh, the society's uh, reprehension of people who do yeah. this? Are we reducing it, or trivializing it? We're not, we hope we aren't. I was just gonna put this on you now, so that any time yeah. I want to get you on the telephone, I can riff back <laughs> and beep you back to the office. <laughs> My thanks to the Attorney General. Next, Madsen Peary, British expert on privatization. After the break. Here was I thinking that Maggie Thatcher, the Prime Minister of the UK, is absolutely down and out. Devastation industrially in the north, things not too bad in the south. And I have here a man says here that you have written speeches for Maggie Thatcher. This is Dr. Madsen Peary, an economist and the expert in privatization. How is Maggie Thatcher's stock today? Currently, she's riding very high in the opinion polls, but she always says the only poll that matters is the one that's taken two hours before the election. Right. And that's the one I think she's determined to be ahead in. 
What is Thatcher's, the secret of Thatcher's success, if she has any at the moment? Privatization. It's the biggest success. Uh, it's privatization. Oh, yes. That means taking all the carefully built up government operations and flogging them to the public. Yeah, it's a sophisticated technique. It means basically taking uh, 150 years of steadily built up ruin and transforming it into success. And that's what we've done in eight years. Steadily built up ruin. Oh, yes. Like, for instance, like the National Coal Mines, the National Coal Board. Yes, uh, you can bet your life that's coming up for privatization within the next few years. That would be certainly be my guess. She's going to sell the National Coal Board. May not be a question of selling it direct. You see, most of the successful privatization we've done has been um, by sale to the workforce rather than the general public. You read here of the, the big ones like telecom, but in fact, worker buyouts and management buyouts have accounted for a very large number of the successes. I'm going to come back to the detail of that, but she, we have a government here, of course, that would sell a kitchen sink if it could get money to meet the debt. And I understand you've seen our Mr. Van der Zandt. I have indeed, but the important thing to remember about privatization is it's not principally about money. It's about transforming industry, transforming the economy from one dependent on the public sector to one with opportunities for enterprise and private sector pressures. It Again, I'll come back to those things, but you're not looking at prisons, are you? Yes, we are. There's two committees reported recently to the government, and both came out in favor of introducing some measure of contracting out because it's been so successful in America. You're they talking about services now, not selling the prisons. We're talking about actually not selling the prisons, but having them run under contract by private firms. It's been such a success in the United States that the committees were very impressed. All right, tell me about the big successes. It appears that there's an element of uh, uh, involvement by the workers when these government mon monsters are sold. Oh, yes. Best example. National Freight Corporation, which we privatized, and many of the, it, it was um, bought out by the workforce themselves. Many of them mortgaged their homes and pooled their life savings. And for every pound they invested then, or for every dollar, it's worth 41 times as much today because the company is so much more profitable now they're working for themselves. This was after the Labour government had nationalized the freight services, is that correct? It was nationalized some years ago, yes. Some years ago. What about uh, the big one, Telcom? Oh, yes. Uh, with Telecom, uh, shares were allocated to the workforce and they were given the opportunity to buy in at uh, preferential rates. Uh, we did that with, with most of the other big ones, British Gas. The average rate of take-up of shares by the workforce has been over 90%. Are these in small bundles, or is it people with money who jump in on the big stock offers? No, this is, mostly, this is mostly ordinary working people who put in their savings. And if I work, say, for the Jaguar division of British Leyland, and it's going to put on the block, you'd do be, I, as a worker, have an edge over the public investor? You'd be certifiably insane not to buy the shares set aside for the workforce, which is what happened with Jaguar. What and proportion is set aside for the workforce? Oh, it varies. It depends on the industry. In the case of telecom, it was about 8%. It was larger in the case of Jaguar. And in the case of National Freight, the uh, management and workforce got them all. Now, what happens? Uh, how much did the raise, we'll say, telecom? How much did the government raise in the sale of telecom to the workforce and investors? I think the total they raised from it was, uh, I seem to remember, about three or four billion pounds. Or and that would go and pay dollar. off the borrowed debt against telecom, would it? Some of it would, yes. Um, in Britain, they have a most peculiar accounting system, and, and the, the money is a straight contribution to the budget. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. This has been going on at such a rate that the government, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, is now getting more money in from sales than he is from public borrowing. What I'm saying is, though, that if I am the British government and I have created the uh, or vast debt, we'll say, in British oil. Does the money that comes from the sale go back to the government to pay off the outstanding debt? Or yes, it can do. Sometimes that's paid off <coughs> in advance. Already written off? Sometimes, yes. So the, the proceeds from the new privatization, therefore, are a bonus to the government to help it cut its expenses. But, Jack, you're, you're asking me as though there were one easy system. In fact, the first thing we found is that every single case is different. There's no such thing as a, an easy formula. You've got to do your homework on every individual case. Tell me, was the primary force for this to be able to cut down the amount of civil servants and civil servant pensions? No, the, the primary motivating factor was a desire to transform the economy because ours was in a real mess in 1979. I mean, Britain was called the sick man of Europe, and, and our living standards were going down somewhere near Bulgaria, and it, something had to be done to turn it round, and privatization was the thing that did the trick. But it, did it have the effect? We suffered, uh, a lot of people suffered very sharply from the cutbacks in government restraint policies. Did it have the effect of reducing the amount of bureaucracy in government? Oh, yes. 
It has very much so. Um, it's taken over 600,000 people out of the public sector into private employment, and the number of civil servants uh, has been cut by uh, more than a fifth, nearly a quarter, over the same period. So we've got very many less people working for government now. What have they got left to sell? Oh, well, uh, by the time you finish with uh, steel and the railways and the mines, electricity and the post office, then the rest is largely a mopping up operation. See, already we, we have gone uh, telecommunications, British Petroleum, aerospace, uh, the, the airline, the state shipping industries, the ports, the docks, the shipbuilding, uh, and, you know, I could go on for another half an hour. Even the docks have already been done? Oh, yes, very much so. Sold as a harbour corporation of some kind? Yeah, British ports. British ports. What about uh, the vast quantity of subsidized council housing in Britain. That's been one of the hidden success stories. I mean, you, you read in the papers uh, abroad about the big ones like telecom and gas, but uh, the sale of these public houses, the council houses, uh, the one millionth home was uh, handed over um, last September, and the target is now another million. That's a million people brought their, hou bought their houses from the state. From the council? Yes, and the formula used was to give them discounts on the market price. If you've lived in the house and paid rent for uh, anything... From two years? From, from two years, you got 20% off. Uh, 40 years, you were up there at 50% off. And this removes the need for a subsidy by the local rent payers... Exactly. ...to and make up the rent in the council houses. That's precisely the point. And also, people take a great pride in their own home when their own capital is tied up in it, and they look after it better, and the houses last longer. Could we do it here? Oh, sure. A hundred countries in the world are doing privatization. There's no reason why Canada should be an exception. How about the British Rail Ferry Fleet? That's gone. Privatized. So therefore, if Van der Zandt talks about selling beasts, oh, no, he can't do that. He's already sold them and leased them back. Mm -hmm. The well, Crown must be the owner, must it not? Yes, you can't privatize it unless it's yours to start with. Yeah, what we did here was we sold the ferries and leased them back, you see. So we got cash up front, and now we're paying off the lease. Yes. That was silly, wasn't it? Well, I, I don't know. There are, I mean, we've used 22 different methods of privatization uh, in Britain, and I'm sure probably another 23 by now since I've been away a couple of days already. So Air, Air Canada would be a good thing that one could work on to privatize, providing it has a good balance sheet. Is that correct? Yeah, it wouldn't be the first airline in the world to be privatized. We've just privatized British Airways in February. Mm -hmm. And that's, you say, a good balance sheet. But British Airways was losing a lot of money five years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been transformed in those five years into, into a really first-class airline. It's profitable, and it was sold, and it was a great success, the sale. Now, you can take almost anything that's losing money and turn it around. If you put in a top management team and tell them you are going to be privatized in three years' time, it's amazing what it does to an operation to hear those words. That's what they should do. Say, take any old loser with potential, any old loser with potential, like Petro Canada, for instance, which is costing us a fortune, or Canadian National Railways, in which we've got about $3 billion involved. Yeah, the whole of the public sector. You can put in the top management team and say you're going to be privatized in three years, but don't you get a lot of labor trouble when you face that? The unions dragging their feet? Well, as I told you, uh, the take up rate by the workforce when we've done these privatization, 90% has been the average rate of the workers taking up shares. What you're telling me is that the workers have that inside knowledge and the administration that run properly, their, their hide-bound old crown corporation could make money. When they're working for their own company, How they, about the post they, they work a lot more efficiently, and they know that in advance. They know where there are opportunities for saving and more efficient operation. That's why they always buy the shares. Sure, post office, yes, very much so. You've done that? No, we will, though. That's my prediction. I Your questions to Dr. Madsen Peary, uh, president of the Adam Smith Institute, by A the way. Another good Scotsman. Dear old Adam Smith, after the break. <laughs> to Dr. Madsen Peary on privatization. How do you do, though, about uh, institutions like hospitals and schools? You can't sell the schools. Well, you can't sell the schools or the hospitals, but you can introduce um, private firms to do some of the services. For example, in the hospitals, a couple of years ago, we privatized the cleaning and the catering service. So these are now done by private firms, very much more cheaply, and that means extra money is available to spend on patient care, on primary medical care. And did you have no major resistance from unions in that? Oh, yes. Some of the union leaders objected, mm -hmm. but it was put through, it was implemented, the savings were made, more money was available to spend on medical care, and everybody benefited. So contracting out is another major step that must be taken by a government that wants to run its 
institutions efficiently. Yes, it's made spectacular strides in uh, city services. What about civic governments? Places like yeah. Liverpool were absolutely on their knees and presumably still are. But a lot of uh, cities in Britain have privatized out collecting the garbage, sweeping the streets, uh, cleaning the windows, and finding they're making savings, which uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies put at 26%, the average saving of using private firms. So that's privatization. The theory of the unions, of course, is that when you take away the good union benefits and replace them with minimum wage people, that your whole purchasing economy goes to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, it's not true, though. What actually happens is that labor is used more efficiently by private contractors because they have to keep ahead of the field. At lower wages? No, uh, they use them more efficiently. But at lower wages than the union wages. Higher capitalization, more modern techniques, more modern management techniques. Fewer people? Yes, fewer people. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack Webster. Yes, yes. Yeah, your friendly ex-bus driver. Well, make it short and sharp. Short and sharp it is. How would you go about privatizing our local transit system uh, when you consider that the morale there is probably... Oh, now that's a stupid question. Why would you ask a distinguished <laughs> guest about the morale in the transit system? Either he can answer it or he can't, Jack. Let him give a chance. How would he go about uh, privatizing a provincially owned transit system, buses and all kinds of other things, including the monorail... The, what do you call that thing? Sky Rapid train. transit. Sky, Sky train. train. Like it doesn't make it stupid. Right. What we did in Britain with a national bus company was to break it up into smaller units and then offer them for sale. And most of those that are being sold are being bought out by the management and workforce. Again, the same principle. They know that working for themselves and using new practices and techniques, they can make a go of it. Where did this wonderful spirit of rebirth come in Britain? I didn't notice it last year. You didn't? No, I didn't. Well, where were you, is the obvious question. Down in the south of England, where ha things are very pro very prosperous. Did, and in Glasgow, where did, things are terrible. Did you fly there by British Airways? Did you no, use I didn't. Did you use any of the docks or ports? Did you use any no, of the I ferry service? Did you travel by bus at all? No, did I didn't. Did you use the telephone while you were there? With great difficulty, I used the telephone while I was you there. You should have tried it in 1979. The biggest trouble in Britain is that when you phone government departments, nobody answers. That's normal. That's, That's how normal. governments behave the world over. Mm. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yes, Jack. It seems to me that this discussion only proves that any time the government is operating a business, it's costing the taxpayers. When you privatize it, it immediately becomes profitable and less of a burden to the taxpayer. I the can, for the life of me, see why we don't do it. You are not only exactly right, but all of the, the sums of money I've mentioned that have been saved so far in subsidies don't even take account of the fact that these private firms are now paying taxes as well. You are absolutely right. Sure. Do you realize here that we have a government monopoly in automobile insurance? Would that go against the grain of Britain? It's something that one would, one would look at straight away and say, is this a candidate for privatization? Could this operate as a normal commercial insurer? A government a monopoly in liquor sales, in effect? I've found one thing throughout the world. Wherever you have a state monopoly of liquor sales, you have alcohol abuse. And you look at the countries in the world that have the worst drinking problems, and they're the ones where there's a state monopoly of liquor. And it even works in the American states. The ones with the worst drinking problems are the ones where the state has a liquor monopoly. But France, which is where there's no monopoly, has the highest rate of alcoholism in the world. The most enlightened example is Scotland, where 10 years ago they had a very bad reputation for alcoholism, and they made drinking very much easier, liberalized the entire law, and the result is it's been transformed in 10 years. They now have less of a drink problem, less crime related to alcohol, less medical problems related to it. That is a miracle indeed. It's typical of Scotland. Go ahead, please. I'd like to find out how much has the sale of these companies increased the consumption and what has happened to the national income as a result of these sales? Uh, what's happened to the national income as a result of these sales? Well, it's now making us, the sales themselves are now making a substantial contribution to the national budget, uh, so much so that income tax is at its lowest point in Britain now for 50 years. And that's due to the proceeds of these privatized companies. It, it's been extraordinarily successful. The companies that have been privatized, with, with two small exceptions in the oil industry, have outperformed the market. They've done better than industry uh, as a whole has done. How many million unemployed in Britain? The total is about three. It's expected to drop below three because it's on the way down sometime around June, according to the minister. Except in Scotland. Okay, well, thank you very much. The thing which I'm looking at is I'm an un unemployed plumber who's been unemployed for two and a half years, and I've been looking at this deregulation and privatization. I'm looking at the free trade with Canada and the United States, and I'm wondering how this is going to affect us. Well, privatization should have the effect of making Canadian industry more competitive. It should lower your basic costs for transport, for telecommunications, for post, and for freight. And if these basic inputs 
are, are at present more expensive than they need be, then you're paying more than you should for your goods and services and you're, you're unable to compete in international markets. Mm. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Webster and Mr. Uh, Dr. Perry Scott. No, he's here. Hello? Yes, carry on. Uh, would it be possible for uh, the sale of petrocan and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to reduce the deficit instead of our taxes doing it? Well, it depends how we finance the debt, I think, does it not? Yes, it gives government the alternative. They, they can decide to use the money to reduce the deficit, reduce borrowing, or they can hand it back to the people in the form of tax reductions. Go ahead, please. Well, I've done that one. Last call, I think it is. We're getting close to the end. Prince George, go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, I'd just like to know um, what this gentleman proposes to do with all the people that are laid off. Well, one of, the great one of the great things about privatization, as it's been done in Britain, is that we've tried to do it as far as possible without laying off people. If you have to reduce the workforce to make the company more effective, more efficient in the private market, we do it by voluntary offers. We offer cash sums, several thousand pounds, so that enough people voluntarily take the retirement. That brings the workforce down to a competitive level. And it's done without compulsory sackings uh, in every case that's possible. A big fuss going on the last time I was over there about the vast sums, big sums of money being offered to miners, right? Yes, the miners were offered the most uh, generous voluntary retirement sums in, in British history. And it works? It works, yes. It brings the industry down to a competitive level. But of course, the Sunday papers would always tell the story about the man who got his 50,000 pounds, went out and bought a new jag and a new house and a new car and a trip to Spain and then went on welfare. Yes, most of them don't do that. I most of them use it to get uh, some kind of retraining or uh, start up in business. I'm only giving you the stock Sunday paper story in Britain. Go ahead, please. Hello, I'd like, uh, I, would, I would think that it would be better if he was a bit more critical of some of the so-called privatization. Okay, ma'am, we're just about out of time. I've been soft on you. Any criticisms of it at all? Badly no, done. No. If How you, many have bombed? It, none. If you do your homework, you'll get it right. And the more you do, the more chance you stand of getting it right. Well, it, it's Britain's success story. It's Britain's success story because it works. You have sold me on it. I shall campaign for it from now on. Sold to the Scottish gentleman. My thanks to Dr. Madsen Perry. I'll be back after the break. Where am I feeling? Where is she from, that woman? A devoted Webster fan from the interior dropped off a cake for me today. There's the cake. It's gorgeous. I don't even know her name at the moment, and thank you very much, ma'am. Tomorrow, Jack Kempf, who will cross the floor today after Van der Zam fired him from uh, his current position. He will answer the charges made against him, I suspect. Tomorrow, also, Peter Duick, Health Minister, and Joan Smallwood on the abortion report at 5 p.m. precisely.